as we begin. Hello, Billy. Good day. Good day to you. How do you begin to break down everything that you said in decades into one book? I mean, what a horrible choice to have to make. Yeah, it's, it was a, a task taken by the publishers. I didn't do much of it. I checked out the end to see if I agreed with it. And uh, most of it I did. Well, that's good. It's, it's, it's okay. Because you could do volumes of these. I, absolutely. It's, so that's why it was best left to someone else to look at it from the outside. Are you, by nature, a very decisive person or a very indecisive person? I'm kind of indecisive and then decisive. I, I don't like to be roped into tasks, but then having been roped in, I'm okay. I can be decisive. Because doing what you've done, especially in stand-up, involves months taken out of your life where every single day, in fact years, where every single day is pretty much mapped out. How do you, what's your relationship like with that kind of uniformity where you know what you're doing every day? It's, it isn't really doing the same every day. Does, do you mean being on tour? Yes, the tour. Does, the, the changes with the town you're in, or the country you're in, things change. And you can, if you're like me, you like to wander. Wander through towns and countryside. and Just get the vibe of what the place is like. I've always done that. And so you can talk to them about the place they live in. And it makes the act so much more alive. And it's, I've been doing it for such a long time that when I was started doing it, it wasn't stand-up. Nobody called it stand-up. You know, just a comedian, that's a comparatively modern term. They used to, before me, there was front-of-cloth comedian. They used to be in the variety theatre and the comedian would stand in front of the, the curtain while they changed the scenery for the singers. The singers were all top of the bill. They, they would have rowing boats and harbour scenes and for these people to sing various songs. Michael row the boat ashore with rowing boats and an old dockyard. And the, the comedian would stand there and go through his funny stuff while they got all this ready behind him. That was his function. They were never top of the bill. And the stand-up came in about the 70s or the 80s. This sneaked in from America. I've, I've never really understood this, the, the term stand-up comedian. You don't get stand-up singers. Stand-up ma ma magicians. Stand-up guitarists. It's, it's a peculiar affair. I've never liked it, the term stand-up. You like comedian? Yeah. Thank you for introducing me to Chick Murray. Oh, here's, he, he's got them. Is that why you have those? No, it's not why I, I have them. But I have them because of old sailors in Glasgow had swallows between their index and thumb. And it was, if they went round the horn, the Cape Horn, if they got to Valparaiso, they would get these. But Chick had them. And his daughter has taken pictures of my hands and she's going to get a frame of Chick's hands and mine. And there's a statue in Glasgow of Chick and me. And they, they can't get permission to put it in the place they want to put it. There's an ongoing <laughs> battle. I've uh, seen that, yeah. That's so annoying. It's, it's not annoying to me. I've, I've never seen the statue. And I don't know how you behave towards statues. I have various bits and pieces around the town, you know, murals and things. And it's very, I'm very pleased with it. Well, Glaswegians are quite, they're iconoclasts. That's why they put a traffic cone on the top of a 
statue, yes. right? So are you slightly concerned that once a big statue of you goes off? <laughs> you, you wouldn't be a proper statue if you didn't have a cone on your head. It's lovely. <laughs> it is lovely. It's something, is it, does that tell you something about the Glaswegian attitude towards life? Yes. They, they were, I remember my daughter phoned me, Cara, and she said, I want you to vote. They're, they're, they're thinking on taking the, the cone off the head of the Duke of Wellington <laughs> and making, and they're going to build around it so as nobody else can climb up and, and, uh, and, and do it. So I want you to vote. And I said, right, I consider me voted. And she phoned an hour later and said, it's been, they've cancelled, they've given in. The council have given in, they're, they're going to have a, a cone on his head permanently. And I thought that was wonderful. This is a lovely sign of what Glasgow thinks like. You are an optimist by yes. nature. You said you loathe pessimists. Yeah. How do you process that? You just, you have to cope on your own with optimism. You have to bash on on your own. You'll never be in the, the majority. The, the majority tend to moan and whinge and they're, they're encouraged to do so by the radio and television with the broadcast media. So if you look at the news, they're all, they're, they start with something you can moan about, like Brexit. That horrible word, Brexit. Nobody knows what it is, nobody cares enough to, to listen to those stultifying bores on television experts dragged up from some grey area to bore us about Brexit. The, the, the big changes need to happen. Good news got to be in the front of the paper. Move the obituaries from the back to the front. The obituaries are the best thing in the paper. If you read the obituaries, it's about great things people have done. You'll, you'll see a picture of a little fat lady who's dead now. And the, the, you read the story, she's helped children to escape from France at the Second World War through tunnels to Britain. And, to, and you think, God, she's a superhero. She should be in the front page. And I, 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 the first thing to do about cheering up the, the media is move those people to the front and get the Brexit people to the back. Get. Boris Johnson to the back page, under fish prices. That's where he belongs, he's a, he's a, a boar. Posing as a, a light of life. I, I can't stand them. Pessimists full stop you can't stand, can you? Pessimists full stop I can't stand. You mentioned the bitcheries. There was a time when you used to quite like hanging out in graveyards. Yeah, I used to. I, I didn't do it much, I, but when I got to towns, I would give the graveyard a swipe, a swipe through, see if I saw anything interesting. People say the most interesting things on gravestones. My favourite is asleep, and I think I don't think so. <laughs> see, <laughs> you'd be f when they open them up. Asleep, and there's a lot of them with Bob Dylan lyrics. They're mostly drug deaths. And it's, it's, it's funny to, to, to look at. Do you know if anyone has inscribed any of your wise words on their tombstone? No, I don't think so. I've never been informed of it. I liked Spike Milligan's, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <That's great>. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you say once that you wanted to uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, is that the time is already? That... <laughs> That's what I wanted. But now you've, I read that you've given up the idea of a grace. So you don't want to be buried, but you do want a, a fisherman's table in your own Yeah, house. I wanted to have a gravestone made into a table on an island in Loch Lomond so the fishermen can have a cup of tea next to it. Do you get much chance to fish now? I yeah, know. I got all the chances in the world to fish. I do very little. You don't seem to be doing very little, Billy. I mean, TV show, book. Um, 
your son Jamie said that it was amazing time spent with you. He really got to know you while you went fishing. Yeah. He said it was a very bright thing to say. Somebody asked him, should dads take their kids fishing? And he said it was great going fishing with my dad because fishing takes a, a quite a long time to get to, quite a long time to do and quite a long time to get back from. He said, and the daddy stuff's good for about an hour. After that, you have to talk to each other. And he unfolded a lot of stuff. He told the story of coming up behind me in New Zealand and I was talking to a bee. He had gone fishing up the river and I was talking to this bee. I was flying. I remember doing it. I remember saying, you don't know me, to the bee. I was saying, you don't know what I am. And I don't know who you are. And we were sitting on the grass talking and he came up behind me and thought I'd gone insane. But it was a lovely moment. And he's, he's a good guy, he's a great fisher. What do you think the key is to being a great storyteller? Because ultimately, you're probably the best storyteller there is. The trick is to believe it. And the best way to believe it is tell the truth. And the stories all should have an element of truth in them. Now, the truth can be boring. You have to sometimes tart it up a little round the edges, round the edges to make it realistically story. And it's, there's no sort of set way of doing it. You just have to have the, the story in your mind of, of what happened to you or what you hear happened to somebody else or what you read somewhere. And then tell the truth and do it like conversation. Just highlight it here and there, and and it, that sounds like nonsense, but it's it comes to life with, with, between you and the audience. The laughs and the sad bits come to life, and, and the audience react to them. And it's it's a joy to do. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Is storytelling, and I kind of stumbled on it. But I remember the, the first big successful one I did was the, the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. And I, it was a guy, what was his name? It'll come back to me. He was, he was a guitarist in a folk band and he came up and he told me a little story. He said that the disciples were sitting in the pub eating Chinese takeaway and Jesus came in and said, where did you get that? And he said, oh, what's his name? What's his name who? Judas. Judas. He said, Judas bought them. He seems to have come into some money. <laughs> that was, that was the, the story. And I went on that night and told the joke and expanded on it. And on the following night, it expanded on that. And it became the the most powerful thing I've ever done. It, people were coming from miles away to hear me do it. And it was filling concert halls. I had to eventually announce that I've stopped doing it. I, will, I won't be doing it after tonight. It was dominating everything I did. But it was, that's what I understood about storytelling, about expanding it and adding every night, subtracting. It's, you must treat it like a live object, the story, and take out things and add things. But that story also, that was the first time you'd come up with kind of public outrage. There were, yeah. there were the angry kind of religious people who took offence. Now they, they take offence to everything. Ah, yes. You can't prepare for that. Right. You, you just do what you think is funny and good. And they'll take care of the outrage. They're, they're always outraged. They get outraged at tight trousers. They get outraged at long hair. They get outraged at short hair. They, they seem to think their position is, in life is to be outraged and offended. 
But you were... They like were, being offended. But you're from the generation that were the first to really outrage that older generation because I know you mentioned that, you know, you heard Heartbreak Hotel by yeah. Elvis and it was like, okay. That's and it was right. the birth of the teenager, right? That's right. It's... The outrage is what they exist for. And to argue with them is, is a waste of time. They don't, you can only argue with someone who's dealing in logic. And they're dealing with a man in the sky who gets upset and they know when he's upset. And it's, I remember reading something where somebody said, beware of people who's, whose who's sentence starts what God meant when he said that. They seem to have a hotline to God. I've managed to offend most of them. But I, I, I didn't set out to offend them. They just got offended. Your dad was a very religious man, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he was, kind of. But there was a, a great deal of hypocrisy in that. Yeah. That's life. D he was a religious man in as much as he believed in Jesus and all that stuff. And not divorcing your mum. And not divorcing my mother. Mm. And then he... I've, I've gone over this so many times. We're not going to, yeah, we don't have to go over that so many times. But yes, it's well, out, it's well known that he wasn't... Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were some very bad sides to him. But did, did you love him? Yes, I did. Mm. I, did I do now. Yeah. It's, I get rid of it by forgiving him. I read a little book in America about forgiveness and, uh, and how it can release you from all those hang-ups. And it worked 100% for me. There's a funny thing you do. You, as an exercise, you sit opposite an empty chair and you, you ask, in my case, my father, is sitting in the empty chair because he was dead. So he was just sitting in this empty chair and I confronted him with it. I said, why did you do that? And then you go and sit in his chair and you try and imagine the answer. And it's amazing how it releases you from, all, from carrying it around like a big rucksack full of rocks. You put it down, I worry about it. I worry when I see children on television with an adult and they've, they've experienced the same thing as I did. And you'll see the adult saying to the interviewer, he or she has ruined her whole life or his whole life. And the children sitting, the child sitting there and listening to this and just assumes since an adult saying it, it must be true. His life is ruined. And it's a criminal thing to do to a child. Your life isn't ruined, you can get beyond it. You certainly did. Where does that, I mean, we, at the beginning of this interview, we talked about how optimistic you are. Where does that come from, this? Because you're an optimism, like, nuclear generator. I mean, yeah. It's considering everything you've been through in your life. You have the most warm face and the smile and... Yeah. Where does this all come from, Billy? It's up to yourself. You manufacture that yourself. You either look at the world one way or another. It's the old half full, half empty. It's up to you. And the world's a great place. It's just full of great people. I've been in countries where, in Africa where people have nothing, absolutely nothing, living in a cardboard thing. And it, like, there's, I was in, Kenya, and it, there's a huge slum there, Kibera. Yeah, I've been to Kibera. Yeah. Have you been to Kibera? Been to Kibera well, yeah. you've experienced I have. it. Yeah, I have. And I remember. It's the biggest slum in Africa. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And I, I was walking along in the morning, and the children were coming out of these houses, which are made of corrugated metal with a sack for a door and smoke belching out. And the children were coming out two and three at a time. 
in school uniforms that were red blazers and grey shorts and grey hose with red bands around the top and sandals and white shirts and grey and red ties. They were like models from a, a, a shop window. They were immaculate. And they were all coming out and going to school. And you say, when they see you, they say, how are you? And I would say, I'm fine, how are you? And they would collapse laughing. <laughs> how are you? I'm fine, how are you? And they would laugh again. And I thought, how does this woman in this house prepare those clothes? She doesn't, she can't have an iron. How does she wash and clean them? They must get dirty on the way to and from school. It was a miracle to see how these kids were turned out. And she obviously has the optimism. And, it's, it's, and it has placed it on the kids and they in turn have the optimism marching along in the red blazers saying, how are you? It was a, a joy to observe. Now you can go to that slum and say, Oh, weep, weep, poor people living in terrible circumstances. Oh, my heart's broken. The choice is yours. You can see the kids going to school in their red uniforms and say, it's brilliant, what a great job they're doing. The choice is yours. I guess in that context, pessimism is a luxury. Of course it is. Yeah. It's a luxury you can't afford, though. It's mm. got nowhere to go. Mm. Another thing that winds you up is beigeists. Yeah, beigeism. It's, it's in the 60s, the late 50s, early 60s, there was, a, there was a, a beigeist revolution in Britain. And they started to paint everything beige. I think somebody invented beige. Or mushroom, it sometimes went under the heading of. And they, there was beautiful architecture and panelling and government buildings and it was all painted beige and and and, and beigeism became the theme and i i, I could see beigeism, beigeism in people that they hated if you if you wore a pink jacket you were weird and strange if you wore a beige jacket that's better there's a lot of people who would have the world be beige and that stretches to comedy as well, right? It stretches to everything. It stretches to drama, comedy, film. British have made a lot of beige films. And I guess the Americans have as well, but they tended to be more colourful. But beigeism is an attitude. It isn't really a colour. It's beigeism. Like the Liberal Democrats are beige. Do you feel you're at war with Beijism? Yeah, I have been all my life. Beijism is where the, the complainers stand. They stand on a Beijist plinth and look at the world and try and make it beige. You but pink jackets are great. Velvet suits, orange velvet, velvet suits. Orange are velvet suits are wonderful. Strange sandals are great. Socks are great. Pink and green socks, teddy boy socks are wonderful. Tattooed hands. Tattooed hands are great. Tattoos are great. Strange hair, dyed hair is great. It cheers the world up no end. What, what rules did you have for your kids growing up? Because, I mean, look, do express... What, what were the rules in the house with we, Pamela we and didn't, yourself? We didn't do much rules. Well, there was never any necessity for rules. They just came, found their lifestyle they liked and got on with it. And they're, they've grown up really well balanced. And there was never any judgment? No. What was discipline like then? If they did something that you felt you disapproved of, how, were you a I found a great thing when the, my children were small. Some American had written, don't ever say your children are bad. Don't tell them they're bad. Tell them it's a bad thing, that they're good. 
You say, no, what are you doing that for? That's what bad girls do. You're a good girl. And, and it, we talk to them that way. From being good, viewing bad. It's, I've, I've seen, I've, I've never hit them. I hit my son, Jamie. He got in trouble in his teens. And I hit him and it did me no good at all. It made me feel a bit better, but it didn't improve his behaviour any. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't work. No. And I, I, I read an extraordinary thing a couple of weeks ago. There were. It keeps. It comes into conversation every few years. Is it legal to hit children? And the the, the argument was so pathetic. They were using weird language like, "I didn't hit him. I spanked him." Uh, the, 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 the spank, hit. You, they use these weird words for physical violence against children. It never works. It never did work and it never will. Children are they're just, they're just wee adults. C considering you had such terrible examples of parenting, where did you get your inspiration from to be a parent? And was there any fear of becoming any of the elements that you saw growing up? I had loads of examples around me. My friends' parents. Right. They were great. I used to love going to their houses and seeing the way they behaved towards one another. And I, I loved it. I loved going to their houses and being in that atmosphere. And I decided very early in my life that when I was older, I was going to live in a house like that, where people were nice to one another. But it's, it's pretty easy to achieve. How, how, is it, how important is geographical distance in keeping a marriage going? Well, that's, that's great. Sailors and soldiers don't have a problem with it at all. Folk singers and comedians don't have a problem with it. Rock stars, you just go to work. And sailors and soldiers go away for 18 months at a time. And they manage just fine. Does the, the, it isn't the, the time away, it's the time you spend together, what you do with it that matters. Spend it together. If you come home and leave and go to the pub and stay there all night, which is what I used to do, then it's dangerous and, and it'll fall to bits. But if you... Come back and live together. It's, it'll work out just standy. Or so time apart is, uh, is is important. There's a great story where you and your sister ended up in the bed of another family. Oh yeah. When you were kids, because the the dad went out for a beer or something, but yeah. before he went in, he had to get all his eleven kids. Yeah. <laughs> you, the, you weren't his kids. They get really angry at me, the Cumberlands for talking about it. The dad's dead now. And, uh, but he came home from work in, in Dover Street in Anderson. It's just down the road there. And This is where you grew up? I grew up until I was four. And my sister and I were playing in the street and his wife told him to get the kids in. He couldn't go for a pint until he got the kids in. So he went out and he got the first 11 kids and stuck them in the house, put them in bed, all sorts of different people. <laughs> and and they, then my parents discovered my mother dis discovered that we were missing and there were search parties out to get us and they found a, a Cumberland and and he was crying they said I can't I can't get home but my bed's full of people and they they went to the Cumberlands and found us in bed with all it Various people. And I, I met my babysitter in London, Ontario. She had been my babysitter in those days. And she was there on that evening and said that the, the room was lit with candles. And it was, it, was, it was a dangerous situation. But that was normal in that kind of situation in Dover Street in those days. Um, because you've been so successful and with success comes material wealth but are you still that 
Glaswegian. He's still that guy. Yeah. It's like, how, how does... Because someone once said to me that fame doesn't change you, it changes everyone around you. I mean, it certainly does. Right. But does it not change you at all? Well... You don't get used to the finer things in life? You do. You have mushrooms for your breakfast. <laughs> that, that, that's, OK. And that's, that's a big that, deal, right? That's about the size of it. You soon get used to the Mercedes and all that. That becomes just a car. Swimming pools. Yeah, swimming pools, blah, de blah. And it, it be becomes normal. And eventually what you miss is having a bash on your guitar with your friends or having a pint, going to football. You, you, you like the same things as you always liked. The same, you read the same stuff. You, you go and see the same performers. Eventually all the, the, the money stuff becomes meaningless. I know it sounds dreadful if you don't have any money, somebody mm. talking like that. Mm. I've experienced it. It's people in the radio from show business, they, they don't realise what they're saying sometimes. They say, it's hell living out of a suitcase. <laughs> You say, well, unpack, you lazy <laughs> Living in a hotel is such hell. It's, it's not, it's wonderful. You have the magic self-making bed. You go for your breakfast and you come back and your bed's made. It's a joyous life. And being apart doesn't mean being without each other. There's, I mean, God knows you can't escape now from people with the, the way telecommunication is. You, you're not big on technology, are you? I mean, no, I'm not. <laughs> so. I, 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 I don't get it. You, you have, do you even have a mobile phone? I have a mobile phone and I can do email and bits and pieces. I'm like that, but I, there's things I can't do and I, I don't intend to do them. I, I, I keep telling myself I should do it. I can't, you know the way you send stuff? I don't know the language of it. The way the people can send you a, a film or a clip of something and you, you download it. I can download it when it comes in, but I don't know how to send it. And I, I, it doesn't affect my, my life too much. It's, I, I would like to do less of it. I, I, have, I started having days off from my phone, leaving it at home, because I missed the times when I was in my car and you couldn't find me. That's your ashram, you said? Yes. Your car is your my ashram. My car is my ashram. And it's, <laughs> that was lovely, just being in my car. And you couldn't get me. I felt so powerful. How did you end up in a Buddhist temple in Lockerbie? I did, I'm a Buddhist, so I didn't know there oh, was... Oh, are you? Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, so I didn't, know, I didn't know there was a Buddhist temple in Lockerbie. Oh, there is. Sami Ling. Yeah. It's a wonderful place. Why did you go there? I, somebody had told me to. <laughs> that, 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 you don't do everything people tell you to do, Billy No, Clinton. somebody said, you, you would like it. Go and my wife put me on to Buddhism in London, I learned to meditate from a Scottish Buddhist monk who learned his, who went, who picked up on Buddhism in this square where we are sitting just now, in a building just over there. He went to an evening of folk music with Peggy Seeger and he had chosen the wrong night. <laughs> but in the room was learn to meditate. And he went and learned to meditate and never looked back. Well, he became my teacher for meditation. And, and through that, I found Lockerbie. And it was, I remember once I was in New Zealand and uh, I was being annoyed in the street a lot by fans. It was getting out of control. And I decided just to stay in the, the room and I meditated for about two and a half hours. And it was lovely. And then I went out and I was going along the road and I started to think 
about a person. And round the corner came the person that I was thinking about. And I thought, oh, that's weird. But it happened about 12 times over the next three or four days. I would think of somebody and they would show up. But if I thought of them on purpose, they wouldn't show up. But if it just crossed my mind, they would show up. And then I was going back to Britain in the aeroplane. We were flying across Glasgow. And we flew over my hometown and I thought, oh, there's Ross Donachie he used to live there. It's the guy I went to school with. The plane stopped. It was like, remarkable in Glasgow. And we come up that tube from the plane to the terminal. And there was, the door was closed at the top and the, the, air, the aircraft person came up and opened it. And there was Ross Donachie standing at the front of the line waiting to get on the plane. And I thought, this is, this, is, this is scary. What am I going to do? Well, I was playing down in the borders near Lockerbie and I went to Sammy Ling. And there's a llama I know there called Yeshi. And I went to see Lama Yeshi, who always knows I'm on the way there. I was, I was just saying this morning that you were on your way and he knows things. And I, and I said, I'm kind of troubled. He said, what's troubling you? And I told him, and he said, well, what's troubling about that? And people showing up, that's a pleasant thing, that's not trouble. I said, no, neither it is. He said, you might find as you do the, if you, as you go through your moves and your breathing, and that the, you get, you'll be able to see into the future or clearly into the past for no apparent reason. He said, you're exercising your mind. It's like jogging for the mind. He said, and these things, will, he said, my advice to you is enjoy it. And that was the best advice I've ever been given. And I've, I've remembered it when, when, when I'm giving my advice to my kids. Is enjoy it. It's just profound advice. You've lived such an incredible life, which you're still living, to be clear. But, I mean, you put that video at the beginning of the year, said, I'm not dying, I'm not dead. Yeah, I made a real <laughs> mess of it. Uh, it's, it's like that Monty Python, bring out your dead, and then there's the old fellow on there going, I'm not dead, I'm not I'm dead. dead. <laughs> yeah, I, there was so much talked about me, about Parkinson's disease and stuff. And then I was making a documentary film and uh, I was asked the question, how's your life now? And I said, it's slipping away. It was a stupid thing to say. All our lives are slipping away. Of course they are. Yeah, from the moment we're born. Yeah. But I was, because of my age, I'm 76, and uh, Parkinson's disease, I felt my, my eyes were, weren't as good as they used to be. And I, was, I had to wear hearing aids and I got, cancer and I, I got gallbladder I had to have it removed and I, I said I'm, I'm, I'm falling to bits and I'm dying and the people took it that I was I thought I was close to death and I started to get messages of sympathy from all over the world and I had to go on t the television and say look I'm not dead I can play the banjo and I've, I have no intention of dying and, and it all worked out pretty good in the end. What would you like as your kind of, uh, the eulogy, what would you like? What's the, have you worked out, I was talking to my, my mate the other day and he's kind of started to think about the music he wants played and all of this kind of stuff, which is fairly morose things to do. But he's kind of in a positive frame of mind. He yeah. wants to do it so someone else doesn't make the mistake and play some piece of rubbish music that he yeah. doesn't like, right? So, have you thought about those kind of things? I think about them constantly. Okay. And I, I change. I change my mind about them and shuffle them and shift them around. I've let my family know some of the things I want. But they, I, I... Choosing music's going to be difficult. I'm in a state of change. Yeah. And it's not that difficult when you... When you like Loudon Wainwright and John Prine and writers like that, Elton John, 
they, they've written some of the most profound lyrics in the world. It's not difficult to find something nice. You're still so funny. You know, giving up sharing that on a stage with people, and I can understand the reasons why, but you must miss it. I don't. I, I, I like being funny, but I don't miss touring and getting up on the stage and doing it. It's a, it's a weird thing. I, I, I look on it as an old friend. The comedy that helped me out of many situations. Do you ever watch yourself? No. I did yesterday. I watched uh, Muppets Treasure Island. You died. I die in it. You're like the only guy ever to die in a Muppet movie. I die in a Muppet movie. <laughs> I die in almost everything. <laughs> My children hate coming to see me in the movies. They're sitting crying. Because I die in it and I've never... I've never gone to a movie and watched my father dying. <laughs> it's it's kind of weird. To be fair though, the first time they saw you in stand-up, I think one of your daughters commented on the fact you'd talked about a routine about piercing the private parts. That's right. That was like, I mean... I said she was about 12 at the time, <laughs> and, I, and I said, what, what did you like best tonight? And she said, the, the what do you call those, the wind chimes? I had done a thing about women hanging wind chimes from the privates, <laughs> pierced, and I, I thought it was great. You had pierced nipples once, didn't you? I did. I had to take them out during the movie, and I couldn't get them back in. And I, I had re I'd been reboard once, and I, I, I didn't want to do it. I, I was a movie. I was in love with Queen Victoria. And uh, I had to swim in the English Channel, and it was in October. So I had taken my nipple rings out to swim in the water, but they shrank and I couldn't get them in. But, but I had done it. I had been there, done that. <laughs> it was good. It was one of the best things I ever did, getting nipple rings. Which is not where I thought we'd end this interview. But... <laughs> <laughs> So, William Connolly, thank you. So much. Thanks very much.